No, they're waving at you. Just a second. We'll get, we'll get away. Did any of you guys get to, while we're waiting, did any of you get a chance to see the final set of the Wimbledon yesterday? Yes. Wow. Wow. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Longest match in history of that long tournament. Over five hours, I guess. Oh, five and a half hours. Could have gone either way. Totally. Ready? Okay. So I'm, I'm going to start today uh, uh, not with my title uh, slide, I guess. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Life and Times of a Mysterious Twin. Remember last night, whoops, I'm going to try and get this correct. Um, that we, we were looking at this slide with the sort of twinning of Clemens and Mark Twain. And uh, what I want to say to begin with is um, that uh, Sam Clemens, Samuel Langhorne Clemens, was an unknown newspaper writer in Virginia City, Nevada, when he adopted that pen name of Mark Twain. He first used the name in February 1863 in a letter to the Virginia City Enterprise, his home newspaper. And he sent that letter from the capital city, Carson City. The letter is a hilarious report on the crazy doings of his friend and rival reporter, a man named Clement Rice. And he names Rice the unreliable. I, I think that may be the name that Rob Fury has taken for me. The unreliable is a fictionalized character who allows the narrator, Twain, to describe the comic words and actions in a kind of dramatic counterpoint. The narrator's always sober, uh, well-behaved. The unreliable is unreliable. So here's a bit of that first letter signed by Mark Twain. Here the unreliable crashes a fancy hotel party hosted by the former California governor, J. Neely Johnson, somewhat like our party we're going to have tonight in Morris House. About nine o'clock, says Twain, the unreliable came and asked Governor Johnson to let him stand on the porch. That creature has got more impudence than any person I ever saw in my life. Well, he stood and flattened his nose against the parlor window and looked hungry and vicious. He always looks that way. Until Colonel Musser arrived with some ladies when he actually fell in their wake and came swaggering inside. First, he ate a platter of sandwiches. Then, he ate a handsomely iced pound cake. Then, he gobbled a dish of chicken salad. After that, he ate a roast pig. Dishes of brandy grapes, jellies, and such things, pyramids of fruits, melted away before him as shadows fly at the sun's approach. So, Next to the unreliable, Mark Twain sounds positively civil and polite. And in effect here, what uh, Sam Clemens does is to create two twins in the letter. Clement Rice becomes twinned as the unreliable, and Sam Clemens becomes twinned as Mark Twain. And for a whole nother year in the Nevada Territory, these two writers, Clement Rice and Sam Clemens, continued to concoct stories about one another uh, with the venues ranging from the two cities of Nevada to San Francisco. Later on, Samuel Clemens would claim that he confiscated the name Mark Twain from a legendary steamboat captain, captain named Isaiah Sellers. Uh, but nobody, no scholar has ever found any writing by Sellers under that name. And, <laughs> In fact, the use of pen names, uh, let's see him, let's see if I can give you him. There he is, about that time. Um, the use of tw pen names were, uh, was really a fashion in the 19th century in those middle years. Journalists regularly adopted pseudonyms and often humorous ones. Uh, stage performers were regularly named, really outrageous things like Petroleum V. Nasby, 
uh, or maybe a more authentic sounding handle like Artemis Ward, uh, a famous humorist of the day. So the private individual in those days remained anonymous while a public figure would become famous or could become famous. So in Samuel Clemens case, the figure of Mark Twain eventually became one of the most famous celebrities of 19th century America and, and one could say of the English speaking world, I would say, perhaps the most. Mark Twain's celebrity started out local and it grew to be global. From 1863 to 1866, he made a living as a freelance writer for Nevada and California newspapers and magazines. And some patterns in the life of Mark Twain as a writer and Samuel Clemens as a person were already uh, apparent in these early years. Uh, Clemens enjoyed living uh, in good hotels. Uh, he enjoyed having entertaining meals and drinking parties with his pals. He found himself regularly scrabbling for money and periodically in debt. At the same time, in November 1865, Mark Twain published a story which he called originally Jim Smiley and His Jumping Frog. That first came out in the New York Saturday Press. The next month, Bret Hart reprinted that story but retitled it The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County and put that in his San Francisco magazine, The Californian. That story became an instant success, a silly tall tale in gold miner vernacular with just the right amount of humor. And uh, it made Mark Twain a name. And over the next months, Sam Clemens wrote himself out of debt published daily, news, uh, daily letters in the newspaper, the Virginia City Enterprise, was paid $100 a month for that work. He got a great travel gig, not as great as the one I just had, but pretty good. He got a job with the Sacramento Union, writing travel letters back to them. 25 letters, he wrote, from the Sandwich Islands, we now call Hawaii. And this went over a period of four months. Then he decided he would use this leverage to give himself a, a venue as a humorist. And so on the night of October 2nd, 1866, the humorist, the lecturer, Mark Twain, appeared before an audience of some 2,000 people in San Francisco and he lectured on the Sandwich Islands. The handbill that he wrote himself for that performance says quite famously, and you'll remember this, I'll bet, the trouble will begin at eight o'clock. <laughs> well, the lecture was a hit, as Twain himself said, a great hit. From all contemporary accounts, Twain was a total innovator on stage. He spoke in a prolonged drawl, one that he would drop when he was in regular conversation with friends and family. He made fearless use of what we might call the pregnant pause, drawing out that silence to the very last moment and then would release what he would call the snapper line of the story. He shambled around stage. I thought about, well, he wore loose, you saw me yesterday, he wore loose, unkempt clothes. Uh, you know, I would look more like an Alaska miner, I guess. He, he also wore old-fashioned string ties, continually fiddled with his hair and this great walrus mustache, kept his hands in constant motion. The audiences loved him. Now, you may be thinking of the Hal Holbrook version of Twain, which, do you all remember that? I, I was a child, I, uh, uh, much younger than Rob. Yes, Mark Twain tonight, we'll, we'll see it. Uh, but a later version, he, he, I saw it in 1966 uh, on TV. 
That's much, much later of the Twain. This Twain that we're talking about was 31 years old. He had a mass of red hair. He had this big red walrus mustache. He was irreverent, sometimes coarse. He was extravagant and bold in his language. And he was a restless dynamo on the platform, always shifting tone, talking, talking, moving with abandon. The other thing to say here is that San Francisco, when he hit it big like that, was the cultural capital of the West. But Sam Clemens knew that in order to make it, he was going to have to go to New York City and Boston, the two capitals of the publishing industry and of the cultural industry of the day. So he negotiated a deal with the newspaper Alta California in San Francisco and the deal was that he would be a traveling correspondent and write travel letters back to San Francisco. So in January 1867, he arrives in New York. And over the next several months, Mark Twain sent a host of articles about New York City back to his California readers. He also published his first book, The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County and Other Sketches probably a book that would be really fun to try to find a first edition of. In May 1867, known as the wild humorist of the Pacific Slope, Twain delivered a debut New York City lecture to a packed house of over 2,000 at the Great Hall of Cooper Union. And you may think of this because at Cooper Union, just uh, 10 years, less than 10 years earlier, Lincoln had delivered a, a magnificent speech. Uh, the audience of over 2,000, packed by people with complimentary tickets that Clemens had printed and distributed the day of the performance. It wasn't about the money, it was about the publicity. The lecture was so successful that he was asked to repeat the performance in Brooklyn and Irving Hall. And then perhaps best of all, Clemens hit on yet another excellent travel gig. This time, he was going to travel with the celebrity preacher, Henry Ward Beecher, who was organizing a cruise to Europe and the Holy Land. The Alta California advanced Clemens $1,200 to pay for the trip. And it led ultimately to his first really successful book, the Innocents Abroad, which was published in 1869. Well, this cruise lasted for five months from June to uh, November, 1867. And in fact, as it turned out, it was going to be a celebrity cruise with Henry Ward Beecher and Tecumseh Sherman aboard. But Beecher um, backed out, even though he had organized the cruise. Uh, when he did, uh, Sherman backed out. And, and then the, the uh, congregation of Beecher's church began to back out rampantly. And they opened up uh, the uh, passenger list for all comers. And the passengers, of ultimately 65 of them, turned out to be a lot older and a lot more pious than Clemens had bargained for. <laughs> Uh, they were also much broader and more representative of American middle class people and were from places upstate New York, where my wife is from, uh, Ohio, Illinois, Missouri, New Orleans, San Francisco. Um, they were not the sort of folks that Sam Clements, Clemens would really tend to enjoy entertaining, but they were exactly the kind of people or characters that Mark Twain could use for satirical purposes. So he found some congenial friends on this trip, a group of about seven or eight men who became a circle of cronies, pals, that he would take excursions with to Tangiers, Paris, Rome, along the way. Um, they were aboard the, the ship, the Quaker City, and they stopped in a variety of places. They stopped in Greece, they stopped in Yalta, where they uh, met the, uh, the Tsar of Russia. Um, they, they stopped in Constantinople. These pilgrims, the, especially the cronies that were traveling, he called them the pilgrims. Uh, there were seven or eight of them. 
they, they traveled to Beirut, Damascus, uh, Jerusalem, uh, and beyond. And that trip really made Twain a double success. Uh, he became, through those travel letters, a really well-known travel writer and lecturer. And then, second of all, it was a success for Sam Clements. One of the passengers on the Quaker City was a young man, a callow youth, sent to get some culture by his father, a man named Charles Langdon. And uh, he became a friend of, of uh, Sam Clements. And when they returned to New York City from their five-month cruise, Charles Langdon invited Sam Clemens to a family dinner, and Clemens met a woman named Olivia Langdon, uh, usually known as Livy. And uh, the Langdons, by the way, were a an in, pretty uh, wealthy family, in fact, not pretty wealthy, quite wealthy family from Elmira, New York. They had businesses in timber and coal. So over the next couple of years after the trip, those two twin successes developed in parallel. Mark Twain spent much of 1868 on the road. He was lecturing nonstop across the country about his travels. He was working feverishly on this book that would become The Innocents Abroad. And meanwhile, Sam Clemens was courting Livy Langdon. Uh, he visited the Langdon home in Elmira, New York. He proposed to Olivia Langdon twice. The two would eventually marry in February 1870. Even though Livy's father made inquiries into Sam Clemens' character since they didn't know anything about him, really. And on two separate occasions, Twain provided his father-in-law, his future father-in-law, with lists of people for references. <laughs> and, and in both cases, the letters came back about Sam Clemens' persistent bad behavior in Nevada and California. These reports were from people that Clemens had recommended to his father-in-law. But somehow or other, Mr. Langdon had his own opinion about this young man. And it was clearly positive. He backed his efforts to marry Livy. He backed his efforts to find a steady income. He bought uh, an interest in a newspaper, the Buffalo Express, so that Clemens could have a job. And he provided them, the young couple, with a house and servants. So that's quite a father-in-law to have. In August 1869, while Sam Clemens was having that success, Mark Twain published the Innocents Abroad, to much acclaim and to good sales. And one of the most important reviews, interestingly, was from a young man, William Dean Howells. Uh, Howells was a young associate editor at the Atlantic Monthly. Uh, some of you may have actually read some of his fiction in, in your lives. Uh, I used to teach it uh, occasionally, The Rise of Silas Lapham uh, or A Modern Instance. Uh, Hazards of Good Fortune, uh, those kinds of novels. Um, he became a really close friend of Clemens, a lifelong friend, probably his best and, and most steady supporter. Their friendship would last for over four, 40 years. So even though Sam Clemens maintained an office uh, at the Buffalo newspaper, uh, his heart was not really in it. And uh, the... Um, Eventually, he sold that interest in the newspaper. He sold the Buffalo House uh, for a loss. Uh, in August 1870, Livy's father died horribly of stomach cancer and uh, left Livy with a substantial inheritance. Um, she had a son, Langdon, in November 1870. Her health was always quite precarious. Uh, she was both very strong but also very fragile. Um, his, Langdon's, premature birth was precarious. In the fall of 1871, with all of this turmoil taking place, the death in the family, the birth of this premature baby, they move to Hartford, Connecticut and start leasing a home in a wealthy neighborhood that's called Nook Farm. So when you read about Twain and you say Nook Farm, it sounds like they're on this farm, but they're actually in this beautiful neighborhood in Hartford. 
In March 1872, Livy gave birth to the first of three daughters, Susie, who was really the apple of Twain's eye, of Sam Clemens' eye. But that same year, just two months later, June, or three months later, June 1872, Langdon died of diphtheria. He wasn't two years old yet. So a lot of upheaval in this family. But Mark Twain's writing was going extremely well at the same time, and he was lecturing wild, widely. You might, wildly too, you, you might say relentlessly. Uh, he was going across the Northeast, across the Midwest, from Boston to Chicago, working hard on his second book of nonfiction about the Nevada days and the Hawaii trip called Roughing It, one of my favorite of his books, published in February 1872. He was also publishing a monthly humor column in Galaxy Magazine, which was a new literary magazine out of New York City in the uh, later 1860s. He even invented and patented a Mark Twain's self-pasting scrapbook, one of his most lucrative business ventures. Now let me move us towards that. So here's Mark Twain's patent scrapbook advertisement. It's an excellent way to appreciate how Sam Clemens used Mark Twain as a marketing tool. During his travels to the Sandwich Islands, to Europe, and to the Middle East, Clemens had become interested in scrapbooks because he kept asking his family and friends to keep the newspaper clippings reporting on his lectures and his travel letters. And along the way towards writing The Innocents Abroad, Clemens lost several of the manuscripts of his letters. So he had to ask correspondents to, for any copies they might have of newspaper clippings that they might have about his travels and about his writing. So this led him to this idea of a self-pasting scrapbook, which would make collecting clippings and other memorabilia, like photographs or cards, very convenient and orderly. What is that thing that people do nowadays that's like that? They, 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 you know, people people uh, will teach you how to keep scrapbooks and so forth. Um, that's a thing. Um, so in addition, of course, the scrapbook is a way of advertising Mark Twain himself as a, uh, an author and a celebrity. So this, this copy of the scrapbook at the University of, of Virginia has a certificate that handwritten by Twain, and it's made out to Sloat Woodman and Company. They were the people who were, uh, his old friend Daniel Sloat was one of the pilgrims on the Quaker City trip. Uh, and they were marketing this scrapbook in the 1870s. And I'd want to read this uh, certificate aloud to you while you look at it on the, on the screen. Monsieur Sloat Woodman and Company, I hereby certify that during many years I was afflicted with cramps in my limbs, indigestion, salt room, enlargement of the liver, and periodical attacks of inflammatory rheumatism complicated with St. Vitus dance, my sufferings being so great that for months at a time I was unable to stand upon my feet without assistance or speak the truth with it. <laughs> but as soon as I had invented my self-pasting scrapbook and begun to use it in my own family, all these infirmities disappeared. <laughs> in disseminating this universal healer among the world's afflicted, you are doing a noble work, and I sincerely hope you will get your reward, partly in the sweet consciousness of doing good, but the bulk of it in cash. <laughs> very truly yours, always, very truly yours, Mark Twain. Well, the scrapbook was sold by traveling salespeople and in stationery stores and advertised in magazines and in these four-page pamphlets. So this is the pamphlet form. And then the next one, the next slide, shows the kind of different bindings that the scrapbook was uh, available for sale. Leather, cloth, sizes. So you can imagine these people in small towns and villages across the US who would be given the opportunity to order Mark Twain's self-pasting scrapbook 
And in addition, I should say, they were also being uh, given the opportunity to order his books. Mark Twain's books were, during his whole career, were nearly always a financial success. They were always in print. And for the first 25 years of his career, he published his books with a company from Hartford called the American Publishing Company. And then he, he switched from that company, run by a man named Elisha Bliss, he switched from American Publishing Company to his own publishing company called Charles Webster and Company. And Webster was uh, a relative of his, an in-law kind of relative of his. They were both subscription companies. This is really an interesting phenomenon. His books were sold exclusively by subscription, which is that they were not available as trade editions in bookstores to begin with. Instead, salespeople with, who were called canvassing agents went door to door showing prospective buyers things like the scrapbook here, different um, samples of what the uh, book would look like, uh, illustrations, options for binding, uh, options for uh, cover, and many of those agents, by the way, were women. Um, the price of the books, the elegant bindings, was as much as three times the normal price that would be the case in bookstores in trade editions. So, in short, um, there's a lot to say about the subscription publishing system, but in short, it worked directly with the traveling sales system for the scrapbook and other items. So you can imagine that things just build upon themselves. In the 1870s and 1880s, Mark Twain became wealthy, significantly wealthy, as a subscription author and publisher. So the scrapbook is a, a, a cute beginning of this, but I've got to tell you, it's one of the best things he ever made. Uh, as far as success, it remained for sale well into the 20th century. The subscription publishing sim uh, system meant that Twain was a popular writer and a household name. It meant that the number of copies of a book would be printed to suit the orders already given, already sold. So there was never any worry about copies sitting in a warehouse somewhere. I'll tell you the story of my first two books from Penn State Press and what they asked me to do with the warehouse copies. <laughs> the subscription system had two other major effects on Twain as a writer. First, the subscription publishers would advertise their books as hefty volumes deserving a luxury leather cover or binding and as a statement of intellectual and artistic heft in the parlor of a, of a family. And this meant that Twain would write his books with a certain number of pages in mind. He would fill the book to fit the requirements of the sales. Second, the subscription system encouraged his tendencies to write in episodes and to digress freely. The plan of a book was always linear and sequential, especially in the travel narratives that he began his career with. So episode would follow episode. In The Innocents Abroad, for instance, he pokes fun at a fellow passenger he calls the Oracle because the Oracle is always summarizing and mangling the accounts he reads in tour guidebooks. He's a lot like the unreliable. But Twain himself uses guidebooks and uses histories to flesh out his own narrative with entertaining facts and stories. So I'm suggesting that it's not just the, the story of the travel that is taking place. It's also, oh, I need more pages. So he'll, he'll fill it out. In Roughing It, similarly, Twain visits Salt Lake City, Utah. Well, he fills that out by giving us four chapters and two appendices of Mormon history. Uh, he reproduces several Mormon narratives, other documents in his text. He quotes the sources at length, throws in an occasional ironic comment to undercut the authenticity or authority of his materials. One chapter begins, it's a luscious country for thrilling evening stories about assassinations of intractable Gentiles. 
Twain did not single-handedly turn the subscription publishing system into a lucrative business, but he was without doubt the most successful subscription author and publisher in American history. Elisha Bliss's American Publishing Company brought out the first novel ever published by subscription, The Gilded Age, 1873. Twain wrote that book with his Hartford neighbor, Charles Dudley Warner. It became a financial literary success. It sold over 50,000 copies its first year. It even gave a name to the era of post-Civil War America that we are looking at from the 1870s through to the 1890s, the time of the Grant administration, the time of reconstruction of Ku Klux Klan, of mass expansion of railroads, of mining interests, of industrialization and mechanization on a new corporate scale. During those same three decades, 1870, 1880, 1890, Mark Twain was publishing a book every two years. He wrote plays, short stories, novels, travel narratives, sketches. Check him out. That's him a little later. The novels and uh, he was publishing in all the major magazines in the country. The novels were regularly published in serial form in places like Harper's, The Atlantic, The Century Magazine. Century Magazine was the New Yorker of the day. He was sought after for after dinner speeches and lectures, for comments, for witticisms. His production was amazing in daily episodes of eight, nine hours of writing, pages produced, which he would write letters, letter upon letter to correspondents bragging about how many pages he had written. Sam Clemens was also busy. The family moved into a palatial home in Nook Farm uh, neighborhood of Hartford in late 1874, just before their second daughter, Clara, was born. They had seven servants, including nurses for each of their girls. They lived like wealthy one percenters. They regularly summered at Livy's adopted sister's quarry farm property near Elmira, New York. And Twain often spent time in New York City and Boston. He was wealthy, a wealthy writer. Livy Clements was an heiress. Yes, they were wealthy. When they traveled to Europe and England, 1878, 1879, they went first class. They carried along an entourage of servants, uh, baggage. In 1876, 1878, Clemens traveled to Bermuda and to Europe with his friend Joseph Twitchell. They did a European walking tour, but in this case, they went by rail, carriage, boat, and it became the basis for his third travel book, A Tramp Abroad. But the biggest discovery, and this goes back to what Mark Connor was telling us last night, I think the biggest discovery of the 1870s for Twain was the Mississippi River to return to that country and to his past as a steamboat pilot right on the eve of the Civil War. William Dean Howells persuaded Twain to write a series of articles about uh, his, his old times on the Mississippi for the Atlantic Monthly, or the Atlantic. And he whipped them out quickly in the last months of 1874. He was just nearing that age of, of, uh, of about 39 years old. The essays were published for the first six months of 1875. They were great narratives and descriptions and a source of inspiration for Twain himself. He realized what he had on his hands there. He had already begun writing The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, and those articles inspired him to begin working on what he called the River Book, and that would ultimately become Life on the Mississippi. So we can certainly say that Howells and the assignment of those articles uh, led him toward his masterpiece, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, and even toward that odd twin novel that we call Puddinghead Wilson. So the years between the adventures of Tom Sawyer in 1876 and the adventures of Huckleberry Finn in 1885, near decade there, that, this was an amazing mixture of success and failure for Mark Twain and Sam Clemens. Mark Twain was clearly at the height of his powers as a writer. In addition to those two novels, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, 
He published A Tramp Abroad in 1880, The Prince and the Pauper in 1882, another twin story, Life on the Mississippi in 1883. He had two different plays produced and staged repeatedly. One of them, called Colonel Sellers, based on the Gilded Age, made him over $70,000 during the decade. I can't translate that into to present terms for you right away. He was so successful as a playwright that he was thinking about not writing books anymore and just writing plays. Well, fortunately, he had this awful collaboration with Bret Hart on a play about comical Chinese people. Well, that convinced him otherwise. <laughs> Meanwhile, for the Clemens, Livy Clemens gave birth to a third daughter, Jean, in July 1880. So the Clemens family, now numbering five, lived lavishly in a Hartford mansion. Their furniture, draperies, statuary, paintings, all of their appointments of this house were imported from numerous European trips. And underwriting all of this wealth and all of this luxurious living was the genius of Samuel Clemens' twin, Mark Twain. Well, Sam Clemens and Mark Twain are almost identical twins, of course, and they're most nearly identical in their ability to put time, energy, and money into big, bad business ideas. As the 1880s began, Mark Twain was a celebrity writer. Sam Clemens was a wealthy businessman. Clemens was constantly on the lookout for a new invention, something like his self-pasting scrapbook, but bigger, more important. He was searching for a technological bonanza, and he was, in fact, personifying the, the Gilded Age that he had named. While the term already had pejorative connotations when it was coined, it also described the new industries and inventions of this expanding American economy. You might think of it as also the age of engineers or the age of systems with railroads leading to finance, management, transportation, and urbanization, all kinds of innovations. Henry Adams observed the new railroad system required the energies of a generation, for it required all the new machinery to be created, capital, banks, mines, furnaces, shops, powerhouses, technical knowledge, mechanical population, together with a steady remodeling of social and political habits, ideas, institutions fit the new scale and suit the new conditions. The generation between 1865 and 1895 was mortgaged to the railways, and no one knew it better than that generation itself. So this was the age of the Gilded Age. This was the uh, age you might think of with Carnegie, Edison, Westinghouse, Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, Frick, Rogers, Ford, Mellon, Morgan, Guggenheim, Stanford, Huntington, robber barons, or captains of industry. Note how many of our museums and libraries are named after these men. So Mark Twain was part of this revolutionary new generation of big business, and he responded to it with enthusiasm. The real story, there are a lot of parts to it, but the focus story I have to go to is he became focused on the work of a local Hartford inventor named James Page, and uh, Page was inventing an automatic typesetting machine, one that would revolutionize the process of putting together newspapers, magazines, and books. At first, Clemens thought this was impossible, but then at the same time, he bought $5,000 worth of stock in the Page typesetter before he ever saw it work at all. He recalled in his autobiography many years later, it is here that the music begins. Ultimately, to cut to the chase, Sam Clemens invested close to $200,000 in the page typesetter. The machine never worked properly for longer than a few hours. He put thousands of more dollars into other printing ventures and into the subscription publishing business that he was running. And although he was the most successful uh, subscription author in America, Mark Twain never satisfied with the sales of the American Publishing Company or his other company, Osgood. Um, so he formed his own company and ultimately 
That company was Mark Twain. Two books that we have to say were published by Twain's own Charles Webster Company, um, bestsellers, landmarks in American literature, we've got to name them, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, February 1885, immediately sold 40,000 copies. Now, more than 20 million copies have been sold. And then maybe more impressive because it was such a great idea on Twain's part and he had so many bad ideas. Um, he landed U.S. Grant as an author, offering this impoverished former president a generous contract for publishing his memoirs. Grant worked tirelessly on this book because he knew he was dying of throat cancer and his family was depending on this book to, to survive. He, he, Grant, finished in the summer of 1885, volume one, Personal Memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant, appeared in December. Ultimately, that book earned his widow, Julia Grant, $450,000. And Twain said, claimed that it netted him $200,000. So the other thing that one netted was, are we almost done? No. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't. But I can tell you what it is. Okay. $80,000 in 1880 is just under $2 million in today's money. Great. Thank you. So, so we're talking about a $10 million bestseller for the widow, Julia Grant. Wow. Excellent. Thank you, Rob. Um, then just real quickly, not, not only was he so successful with these two books and as a publisher and writer, Twain was also appearing uh, as a lecturer. And he, he went around with the Creole, Louisiana Creole writer George Washington Cable uh, in 1884, 1885. It was called the Twins of Genius Tour. Uh, lovely. Those twin geniuses traveled to 80 cities uh, in those winter months. And uh, meanwhile, Century Magazine was publishing the first excerpts of Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. The celebrity was just incredible at this time for, uh, for Twain. And celebrity breeds celebrity. Lectures increased book sales and magazine sales and magazines and books increased audiences at the lectures and it just goes and goes like that, a feedback loop. In uh, April 1885, James Page announces the perfection of his automatic typesetting machine. Uh, Clemens enthusiastically formed a company to begin looking for investors and to uh, market the machine. Um, Webster and Company, uh, flourishing at first with Huckleberry Finn and U.S. Grant as the Page typesetting machine goes its inevitable descent into bankruptcy, so the subscription company, Charles Webster and Company, goes towards bankruptcy. Uh, it is true that Twain had some really poor ideas for uh, uh, titles in his publishing company. He also had some great ideas, multi-volume works, but then people would only buy a couple of the volumes and then stop paying. Um, so they, uh, every ounce of gold created by the Webster Company subscription uh, publishing system went into the page typesetter. By the summer of 1893, uh, Webster and Company owed Sam Clemens and Livy Clemens nearly $200,000, so a couple of million dollars, and loans of over $100,000 to Mount Morris Bank in New Jersey. The page company, was teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. It owed large sums of money to investors in Chicago. In April 1894, Webster and Company liquefied. By December, Page Compositor Manufacturing Company dissolved. In total, Samuel Clemens lost somewhere between $170,000 and $300,000, somewhere around three to five million dollars in today's money. He was saved from utter ruin by a, an industrial, industrialist friend of his, H.H. H. Rogers. Uh, Rogers took over Clemens' financial troubles, managed to whittle that debt down to 
a mere, Rob, $80,000, so a million, two million. Um, the arrangement put all of Mark Twain's copyrights in the hands of his wife, Livy Clemens. The family took it on themselves to make other arrangements. There was a headline at one point, Mark Twain bankrupt. By that time, the whole family had moved to Europe where they lived uh, from 1891 on in order to, isn't this interesting, to be economical and frugal. Uh, his daughters, Susie and Jean, lived with relatives in Elmira. They weren't really destitute for, you know, people who owed millions of dollars. The family still had Livy's income from her inheritance. Um, they still had income from Twain's backlist, an occasional scrapbook. Uh, they had income from magazines and journal articles. But they couldn't afford to live in their Hartford mansion and they uh, last visited that mansion in March 1895. He hit upon a scheme for uh, working his way out of debt. He would make a huge lecture tour around the English-speaking world. He would travel the globe, USA, Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, India, Southern Africa, Great Britain, it ran for a full year, from July 1895 to July 1896. He, he uh, went with Livy and with the second daughter, Clara, and the three of them were always accompanied by a lecture agent and other companions. They always traveled first class while he was earning his way out of um, debt. Uh, in several places, several parts of the tour, he recorded really no profit to speak of, but he did send home money constantly to H.H. H. Rogers. And a year after the tour, he published a travel book following the equator and was paid $10,000 as an advance for that book and for magazine publications by Harper's. So ultimately, to cut, this, cut to the chase on Twain and bankruptcy, by March 1898, Rogers had negotiated the final payment of all of Samuel Clemens' debts. Now, he didn't pay it 100%, but he did pay a lot of it. This, by the way, uh, that you're looking at is a picture of him from Australia from a, photo a photography studio and was used as a publicity uh, photograph for some of his lectures on that world tour. I want to mention two novels from this period. In 1889, he published A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. Uh, the main characters, I'm going to return to them even though I didn't make you read it. Um, I'm going to return to them later this week. The Yankee, Hank Morgan, is a foreman in a Connecticut factory. And then, of course, the other uh, main character is King Arthur of Camelot. This time travel fantasy brings all of the material progress and middle brow culture of 19th century America to the world of medieval England. Uh, Abby Montgomery, notwithstanding, uh, middle brow culture means knights learning to ride bicycles and play baseball. Uh, Merlin, completely overtopped in wizardry by Hank Morgan's fireworks. Like a pair of twins or twin opposites, the king and Morgan go on an odyssey through England pretending to be commoners. The horrors of medieval life and of serfdom are made abundantly clear to both of them. And then, amazingly, with all of this material progress through and laughing at the medieval age, um, the novel ends in an apocalyptic war. Hank Morgan against the Knights of the Round Table and their allies. Gatling guns, bombs, trenches filled with fire lead to the wholesale destruction of the world of King Arthur. Morgan is assassinated but reawakens in 19th century Connecticut as if the entire novel has been a dream. Or was it a nightmare? The second novel, which we have read, Puddinghead Wilson, published in 1894, just before Twain declares bankruptcy and begins that world lecture tour. It returns Twain to the world of the Mississippi River before the Civil War. That's a return to the world of African-American slavery, systemic and legal racism. There's a great deal of humor in that novel, I think, and we'll, we'll see this in a couple of days during our discussions. But the events of that book focus most especially on the effects of social conventions and assumptions on 
human character, we're constantly being formed and deformed by those around us and by the unspoken laws of the world we inhabit. Character is not so much born in that novel as made. The twins in Puddinhead Wilson and in the, the twin novel, Those Extraordinary Twins, reach far into Twain's late, dark vision of humankind. These images of the last years, just to see those, there he is at a, uh, he wrote a, a history of Joan of Arc, and there she is presenting him with a uh, laurel wreath at a dinner party in New York City. Um, Sam Clemens' losses, as you know, became deeper and deeper, and much deeper than mere dollars. And Mark Twain continued to enjoy great fame and popularity, even as his vision darkened even more than what we experience in Puddinghead Wilson. When the three members of the Clemens family arrived in England at the end of July 1896, after their uh, world tour, they immediately telegraphed the two daughters, Susie and Jean, who were still in Elmira, New York. They asked them to book passage immediately for England so that the five family members would be able to spend the summer and fall together before heading to the continent. They still imagined that it was much cheaper to live in Europe, and maybe it was. But then they also learned at that point that Susie had fallen ill, though the telegrams kept reassuring the Clemens that she was going to be fine. Livy and Clara booked passage and sailed at once for America to find uh, Susie and Jean. Sam Clemens stayed in England lecturing as Mark Twain and working to begin working on following the equator, that travel book. August 15th, Susie Clemens dies of spinal meningitis. Clemens learned of her death by telegram. Clara and Livy got the news while they were aboard the steamer on the way to the United States. Two more losses follow. After a lifetime of managing difficult health problems, repeated illnesses, and yet being a very, very strong person, Livy Clemens dies in June 1901 in Florence, Italy, 57 years old. In December 1909, Jean, who had always, the youngest, who had always had some, some mental problems and difficulties, she died from heart failure while having an epileptic seizure in the bathtub. Clara Clemens, the middle daughter, was the only surviving member uh, of the family, the only member of the family to survive her father. Clemens spent the first three months of 1910 in Bermuda, returned to a villa in Reading, Connecticut, Stormfield, which he had built late in life. And at the very end, uh, Clara was with him, holding his hand, and hearing his very last words, goodbye. That's it. So Rob, do we have time for yeah. questions and